Welcome to Saints and Sermons. I'd like to read to you the Gospel for the second Sunday after Easter called Domenica in Albis and also Divine Mercy Sunday. The reading is from John chapter 20 verses 19 to 31 and the, the Gospel is taken from uh, the Sunday Missal from Bishop Fulton Sheen. At that time it was evening, on the same day, the first of the week, and the doors of the place where the disciples were staying were closed for fear of the Jews. But Jesus came among them and stood there and said, Peace be with you. After this greeting he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed at seeing the Lord. Then Jesus spoke to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you absolve are absolved. Those whose sins you absolve are absolved from their sins. Those whose sins you retain remain in their sins. Now one of the twelve, Thomas, also called Didymus, had not been with the other disciples when Jesus came. And when they said to him, We have seen the Lord, he replied, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the place where the nails were and my hand into his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, the disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus entered. He stood there among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Come, where is your finger? See my hands. Where is your hand? Put it into my side. Set aside your doubts and believe. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without having seen. Jesus did many other miracles too in the presence of his disciples, which are not set down in this book. This much has been written down so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in His name. Praise to Thee, O Christ. John 20 is seen as the fulfillment of the promise that our Lord made to the Church through Peter on the road to Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, he tells Peter. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The image of the keys and the image of binding and loosing imply the forgiveness of sins. The keys of the kingdom is an image which implies authority on earth over the kingdom of God. That is, to admit or exclude. And since entrance into the kingdom is compromised because of sin, it follows that the power to forgive sins is implied by the giving of the keys, the opening and the closing of the portals of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven is a rabbinical expression regarding the proper interpretation of the law, either to permit or to forbid an action. It also implies the exclusion from the community because of the imposition of a moral ban or the lifting of a moral ban. My point is that 
since sin is the exclusion from the community, the image of binding and loosening implies the forgiveness of sins. That promise of our Lord to Peter is fulfilled now after the resurrection in these words which he says in the upper room in which he appears to them even though the doors were locked for fear of the Jews, John says. Receive the Holy Spirit whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. It is fitting that this power to forgive sins, which our Lord Himself shows to possess as the eternal Son of God during His lifetime, is now given to the Apostles. And it's given not only to the Apostles, but all those who succeed the Apostles. Because our Lord intends not only that sins be forgiven for those who live in the time of the Apostles, but also those who live until the end of time. Those who desire the salvation that He came to bring us. Those who are willing to do what is necessary to receive the saving grace that Christ has given us. The forgiveness of sins is the first fruit of the redemption. And it's fitting that it be given now in his first appearance to the apostles in the upper room. And keep in mind, this power to forgive sins is truly an eradication of sin. Unlike the reformers who maintain Jesus gave the apostles the power to preach the forgiveness of sins or he gave them the power to uh, remit the punishment to sin or he gave them the power simply to cover them, cover the guilt of sin. No. The full force of those words, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained, implies, I should say, is quite explicit. It is explicitly telling us that sin is eradicated by the judgment of those who succeed the apostles. Now, our Lord specifically says, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Our Lord loves us unconditionally. God's love for us is unconditional. But His forgiveness is not unconditional. The condition is that we acknowledge our sins, that we be sorry for them, that we confess them. Otherwise, how would it be known what sins to forgive and which not to forgive. When you go to the doctor, do you simply say, I'm sick? Or do you have to point to the wound precisely where you are hurting, where you're ailing? And that's what we do in the sacrament of, of penance. We point to where we are ailing, where we are sick, morally sick. And so there is this necessity of confessing our sins. And according to the teaching of the church, to confess all the mortal sins according to their kind and their number. This is the sacrament of penance. And I might add, it should not be referred to as the sacrament of reconciliation because this sacrament is also salutary for those who are in venial sin, which does not alienate us from God. Mortal sin alienates us from God and requires a reconciliation, but not venial sin. Therefore, it is more properly referred to, as the Church does in her documents, as the sacrament of 
penance. Because it includes not only those who, through grave moral fault, have lost grace through mortal sin, but also those who have obstacles in the way of their perfection of charity. And it is highly recommended that we use the sacrament of penance even if there be venial sins. It was once called Dominica and Albus because of the practice in the early church whereby those who had just been baptized were now able to take off their baptismal robes after eight days of baptism. It's also called Divine Mercy Sunday, which is an additional title not a novelty. Divine Mercy Sunday is the equivalent in the New Covenant of the Old Feast of the Atonement. And just as those three feasts in the past, which formed the trilogy of the Old Covenant, the Passover, the Atonement, the Pentecost, so too today. The Passover is fulfilled in the Paschal Mystery, the Triduum of Holy Week, the Pentecost, by the giving of the new law of love by the Holy Spirit, and also the atonement is fulfilled by the divine mercy. On this day, the Church allows us to gain the plenary indulgence, the remission of all of the temporal punishment due to sin under the normal conditions. Dear friends, we must be today like St. Thomas the Apostle who took his finger and hand and examined the wounds of our Lord to know that Jesus has risen from the dead. Those wounds are the outward signs, the indicia of God's mercy. And when we go to confession and we prepare well and we make a full integral confession for our sins for which we are sorry, we are like Thomas. We are putting our hands, our finger, in the wounds of his mercy and we say like him, my Lord and my God, my Jesus, I trust in you. God bless you. Ave Maria, gratia plena,